Ahead on the point, a disturbing question about the source of the anthrax scare. While we have not ruled out linkage to the terrorist attack of September 11th or the perpetrators of that attack, we do not have conclusive evidence that, that uh, would provide a basis for our conclusion that it is a part of that terrorist endeavor. The Point, tracking the terrorists, is coming right back. few days, so can the U.S. mail. The U.S. Capitol was crawling with FBI agents and hazardous material teams today, prompted by a letter that was opened in Senator Tom Daschle's office yesterday. And that was just one of many. Here's a report from Nightline correspondent John Donovan. John? Ted, tonight the FBI told us the number of calls it has received so far from people reporting anthrax or some other suspicious substance. Since October 1st, 2,300. And while most of those calls have been false alarms and a troubling percentage of those were deliberate hoaxes, the one that has Washington most worried tonight is the letter that was opened yesterday in Senator Tom Daschle's office. Today we learned it was not just anthrax in that envelope, it was anthrax of such purity and sophistication it could only have been engineered by a state-run laboratory with the resources and expertise to make anthrax into a weapon. The FBI released a photocopy today of the envelope it arrived in. The postmark, Trenton, New Jersey, October 8th. The return address was to a school that does not exist. And the letter it contained said, 91101, this is next, take your medicine, death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great. But it was the purity of that anthrax that for investigators is both a worry and a clue. ABC's Brian Ross. This is the kind of anthrax that experts call weaponized. And what that really means is it's small enough to be inhaled, which is the more deadly form of anthrax. Those small particles between one and five microns that can go into the lungs have a tendency to clump together. So various countries have come up with ways to create anti-clumping material that keeps them apart, keeps them in the air. The places that have done that include Russia, Iraq, Britain and the United States. It takes a lot of money and special machinery to do it. This is how it looked around the Capitol building today, practically empty outside, which is definitely not normal. Inside one of the Senate office buildings, not normal either. They shut down the offices of 12 senators so that hazmat teams could sweep for anthrax. Then a line formed for people to be tested for anthrax. Ultimately, hundreds of people were waiting their turn. Staff, service people, and U.S. senators. There is at least a remote chance that spores could have gone through the ventilation system. Side by side with the Dashiell envelope, authorities released a copy of the envelope that was mailed to NBC News and that also tested positive for anthrax. They believe they see a similarity in the handwriting. The NBC letter also bore a Trenton, New Jersey postmark, but it was mailed 22 days earlier than the Dashiell letter. Tonight, sources tell ABC News that the anthrax in the NBC envelope was relatively crude, which is a puzzle now for investigators who are comparing it to that more refined weapons-grade strain. Investigators have another problem to deal with right now. They are using up valuable time chasing down anthrax reports that turn out to be somebody's idea of a joke, planting white powder so that people will think that it's anthrax. This does not help the cause at all and they are making it clear that anyone they catch doing this is in serious trouble. They seem to be making an example of this man, Joseph Farinars, who they say deliberately touched off a scare last week in Hartford, Connecticut, where he worked at the State Department of Environmental Protection. In Washington, the nation's top law enforcers actually devoted a good piece of an FBI news conference to his case. The complaint charges that Farinars knew the incident was a hoax, but reportedly stood by silent as 800 employees were evacuated and 12 employees were forced to disrobe and be washed down with a decontamination solution. Officials of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection report that the two-day evacuation of their facilities necessitated by this hoax may cost taxpayers up to a million and a half dollars. 
Which raises another point about this week of anthrax scares. The money those alarms are costing is beginning to add up. So is the time and the energy they require. Time. A Northwest flight delayed on the runway for two hours early this morning because of a powder that turned out not to be anthrax, an honest mistake. And a Delta flight later in the day also delayed for two hours because of a white powder that turned out to be artificial sweetener. As for energy spent, Hazmat crews have been working all out, all over. Today it was a social security office in West Palm Beach, Florida that had to be evacuated. Here in Washington, there was a call to the offices of the Washington Post. Earlier, they were here at our ABC News Washington studios to take away some mail that seemed suspicious. It just means that these units are running up and down the street. They're not available for regular emergencies, fires. The fear is spreading overseas. London Stock Exchange was cleared today after receiving a bogus threat. In Australia, on Monday, there were 57 calls for suspicious substances. Hospitals, meanwhile, are beginning to figure out that if there is a large-scale biological attack, they will probably be overwhelmed. Today in Chicago, at a convention of emergency room physicians, they said at a press conference that in this country there are no longer enough emergency room services after years of cutbacks. An attack, said one doctor, could push us over the brink. Money, time, and energy. And what did it cost whoever sent those letters? Well, aside from the anthrax bacteria, 34 cents for first-class postage and a trip to the mailbox. Ted? And the, the amount of reaction. I think, John, you just want to give our viewers a little bit of sense of the scale. And I should point out that those of us in the television business uh, are not unaccustomed to getting wacko letters and some of them even threatening letters that's been happening certainly for the 21 years that I've been doing this broadcast. But the dozen or so letters that were handed over this morning by ABC management they called the fire department, I think really believing that someone was just going to come by and pick him up, yeah. in point of fact. Right. We, what, what had happened here is that our mailroom had sorted through the mail as they normally do and found that there were some, as there always are, some uh, letters without return addresses or for one, other, for one reason or another somewhat odd. There was no powder. There was no signal that there was anthrax. But they, just to play it safe, they said, let's not put these into the system. Let's get rid of these. And then the thought was, well, if we think that there's any problem, should we be putting them in the trash? And so a call was put to the fire department. What do we do with these? Can you take them away? Not only did the fire department come, but an entire hazmat team showed up, as you saw uh, pictures of just briefly. And uh, police came, and it turned into... And then camera crews came because of uh, all of the flashing lights out in front of ABC News, and it turned into, into quite a scene, which drains, as we're saying, energy, time, and money. And we think that pattern is probably being repeated all over. Now, also at ABC News tonight, uh, on our nickel, uh, ABC News itself decided to bring in a team just to investigate the building that we're in now, uh, just basically to put, I think, primarily to put employees' minds at ease because of what uh, happened to our uh, colleague's baby up in New York City because of NBC, because of the Senate, and because we do get that sort of mail uh, regularly, as you say, just to check around. And so we got to see up close what it is that they do. Um, and uh, they're, they're looking at ventilation systems. They're looking at yeah. keyboards. Uh, they're looking near mail, mail areas, uh, basically sampling the air and, and using these swabs to, to see if they're picking up anything. Just very quickly, John, in the few seconds we have left, the baby you made reference to before, the baby of our producer up in New York. Apparently, things have turned around and he went home with his mom and it looks like he's going to be all right. And when you made the reference, I think you said 2,300 calls that, that were made and some of them, we've got about 20 seconds left, some of them... Hoaxes. Most of them hoaxes. Uh, we're not sure if it's most of them. I think, there's, I think a lot of it is genuine fear. Not that everybody's out there trying to plant powder, but a lot of people are seeing things that might be there naturally. They might see construction dust, something like that. And I think a lot of them are just uh, honest to goodness fear. But at this point, the FBI is saying we are going to check out all of these things. And I think that's what's keeping them so busy. John Donvan, thank you. So who could have manufactured the actual weapons-grade anthrax? In a moment, an interview that we recorded earlier this evening with a man who was the Army's Deputy Commander of Medical Research for Infectious Diseases. This is ABC News Nightline. 
Brought to you by Bristol Myers Squibb. Enter a new era of discovery at Bristol Myers Squibb, where groundbreaking genetic research is underway. Winning the Tour de France was a victory for cancer medicines, but Luke, it's just the start of incredible things to come. At the Bristol Myers Squibb Center for Applied Genomics, researchers strive to unlock the secrets of breast cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes to lead the way in new frontiers against disease. Hope, triumph, and the miracle of medicine. Bristol Myers Squibb Company. Checkup, booster shot, and lollipop, $110. Ouch. Your brother's turn, priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For back to school stuff, there's MasterCard. Imagine combining the stain fighting power of Effortant and freshening power of Listerine. You'd get Effortant Plus. It's extra fresh, and nothing gets your dentures cleaner. Effortant Clean, Listerine Fresh. Ah. That's Effortant Plus. Think life hasn't become outrageous enough? Check your email. They're called Urban Legends. They might be bogus, but why do so many need them so? 2020 Wednesday. Maybe it was inevitable that the boy would learn about the meat business from his dad. Look at me! Let me fix your hat for you there. No, that's just not good enough, Al. About freshness and unwavering standards. Son, always give them the best. Lucky for us, because this kid grew up to become owner of Ingalls Supermarkets. Good morning, Mr. Ingalls. Good morning, how are you? And that's why you can always count on getting the best meat in town at Ingalls. The CRV from Honda. It'll take you to the mountains. It'll take you to the beaches. It'll take you to the desert. It'll take you just about anywhere. But it won't take you to the cleaners. The CRV from Honda. While supplies last, get special APR financing as low as 1.9% for 36 months on 2001 CRVs. And joining us now, Dick Spurzel, who led biological investigations for the United Nations weapons inspectors in Iraq from 1994 until 1998. He is now a consultant and lecturer on biological warfare. Dr. Spurzel joins us here in our Washington studios. Let me begin, if I may, by asking you whether, whether you perceive any difference between the, the anthrax that was mailed in to those newspaper offices in Florida and what we have seen over these last couple of days. Oh, absolutely, Ted. There's a marked difference between the material delivered to Florida, that delivered to the NBC headquarters, and uh, what we've seen now to Senator Dashley's office. The material from uh, Florida was clearly a less, a more crude preparation, if you like, that involved small enough particle size to get down inside the lungs, as well as very large material that would settle out onto surfaces. On the other hand, the material f that went to the NBC headquarters in New York, which was described as a brownish granular material, uh, is of a nature that would not have gotten down into the lungs at all. And on the other hand, as the description now is coming forth on the material that went to Senator Dashley's office, appear as described as being very pure and of professional grade and what that tells me is the very pure means that it was predominantly spores and no extraneous or relatively little extraneous material included how difficult a process is that that's extremely difficult and requires very very specialized knowledge knowledge that is not readily available and not known to very many people, at least in the U.S. When we are talking about the material that was delivered to Senator Daschle's office, it's your impression that that would have to come, I mean, when you say there are very few people here in the United States who would know how to do it, what do you mean by very few, a hundred? Uh, I would put it maybe in the number that could be counted with one hand. 
Fewer than five. Fewer than five. Uh, so you're, you're, you clearly don't think it, it was manufactured by anyone here domestically? Uh, I don't believe it was done by anyone here domestically. That's correct. Unless it could have been done domestically by somebody brought in or somebody to whom detailed advice, directions, and so forth. But now I take your point. So you're saying there are foreign experts, but you don't believe that any American designed this. In other words, this is not the work of some left wing or right wing nut group that just decided they were going to take some anthrax spores and see what they could do with it. Absolutely, Ted. There's no question about that whatsoever. Uh, the, the few people that I know that know how to do it would not be engaged in such activity and it's not something that the average individual is going to learn how to do uh, without uh, t a lot of trial and error and perhaps very detailed guidance. Now you spend a lot of time over in Iraq. There are people over there who know how to do it? Uh, there are people in Iraq that know how to do it uh, and of course we can't forget that there there may be many scientists in the former Soviet Union during their program that would know how to do it. What other countries? Uh, the other countries I don't specifically know about, although if they have an advanced program, as is said to be perhaps in other countries, they could have it. All right, so I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, let, let me say it. You tell me whether I'm spouting nonsense or whether I've got it right. You're saying you don't think, in fact, you're almost sure that it was not any American who did this. That is correct. Because there are too few people in this country who know how to do it. You know those people. They're not the kind who would do this. Absolutely. You're saying it could have been someone from the former Soviet Union. They had the people who knew how to do it. That is correct. And it could be people from Iraq. They had the people who knew how to do it. That is also correct. Is it likely that from what you know about the Taliban, which Lord knows is made up, or of Al-Qaeda, which seems to be made up of, uh, of revolutionaries from Sudan, from Egypt, from uh, Afghanistan itself, uh, is it likely that they on their own could have had, A, this kind of knowledge, and B, the kind of equipment? Uh, Obtaining the equipment, if they know what needs to be done, if they know how to do it, yes, they could obtain it, the necessary equipment. The know-how, however, would either require years of effort on it or, as I've said before, somebody, someone to give them rather precise directions and guidance. The rest of that interview with Dick Spurzel in a moment. You're going to go on a cruise. It's expensive, though, isn't it? No, no, it's, it's, it's a lot less than you think it was. Food's all inclusive. You've got your hotel right there. You never have to fly anywhere. You never have to unpack once. It's great. Oh, the ladies are going to love you for this. Your, your wife is just going to sit there and be, oh, honey. <laughs> oh, and you know, every once in a while you get to go golfing. And then you get to eat, and then you get to go snorkeling if you want, and then... Uh, did I mention that you get to go golfing? Yeah, you did. We Americans are going through a tragic time. We all have painful emotions following these hideous events. Here are some ways to get through this time of crisis. Please ask for help if you need it, and participate in any way you can. Donate money, donate blood, or volunteer. For information, contact your local American Red Cross chapter or visit redcross.org. Together, we can save a life. toothbrushes are not created equal. Sonicare. It has patented sonic technology and combines high-speed bristle motion with dynamic cleaning action 
So effective, Sonicare removes 80% of stains, getting your teeth whiter and healthier in 28 days, guaranteed. See for yourself or ask your dentist about Sonicare. Good morning, America. It's a brand new day. Fresher and livelier than its competition. Good morning, America scores. Do something good for yourself. Good morning, America. So, how's the food here? Great, Mom. Pizza every day. That's what I was afraid of. Oh, it's not what you had in college, Mom. It's Papa John's. But you need variety. Variety? I get it with Papa John's thin or original crust, great fresh veggies, and 100% meat toppings. And right now, a large two-topping Papa John's pizza is only $9.99. Plus, a second large two-topping pizza is just $4.99. I'm living better than I ever did at home. More now of the interview I conducted earlier this evening with one of this country's leading anthrax experts, Dick Spurzel. As you look at what's been happening in this country over the last few days, is it your impression that everything that has been done has been done by the same person or persons, or that we have more than one group at work here? It has been my impression for the last several days, in fact, that we have several cells of individuals working, perhaps independently or semi-independently. Uh, that is based on such things as you find the granular powder uh, or the granular material that was sent to NBC headquarters. That is not something that would be done by an individual that knows how to make the quality of product as seen in Senator Daschle's. There is one thing that confuses me about what you've told me. So far as we know, there has been only one fatality, and that came from the Florida incident. And yet you say that was of a cruder variety, and the material that was sent to Senator Daschle's office uh, has, uh, mercifully for the moment at least, apparently not injured or caused anyone to fall sick. Well, I don't mean to frighten anybody, but we have to understand that the exposure of the individuals to the material that arrived at Senator Daschle's office has not yet gone far enough for them to be exhibiting symptoms. The incubation period of the disease, that is the time from exposure to onset of symptoms for inhalation anthrax, is generally said to be three to five days. It can be out to five or six weeks or more. The fact that none of these people has as yet exhibited any symptoms and that all of these people presumably have been put on antibiotic should mean, should it not, that they have been treated in time. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the one feature of inhalation anthrax is that generally you can prevent death from inhalation anthrax if antibiotic therapy is initiated within the first 12 to 24 hours of onset of symptoms. When it's done before the symptoms begin, the chances of survival should be greatly increased over that. One last question, Dr. Spurzel. What we have seen so far, uh, as frightening as it is, this is not really a biological warfare attack, is it, in the sense that we have been fearing it all these years? Uh, not at all. The, the, what we have seen so far is almost classical bioterrorism. And that bioterrorism can occur whether it's a single individual or an organized situation or, as I suspect in this case, uh, has some foreign connection. But this is classical bioterrorism. You are exposing individuals to a biological agent. You have had some success. I'm speaking now as if you were the terrorist. You have had some success in uh, uh, creating illness and in at least so far one death. Uh, that's pretty good success rate for bioterrorism. I wish I knew the right question to ask you after that to put people's minds at ease a little bit. Is there anything you can think of that would, in fact? Uh, the best that I can think of, I, I, as I've told 
many people that I don't think that this bioterrorism is something to be afraid of. Can we prevent it happening? The answer is clearly no. What we can do is to minimize the effect, and if recognized in time, probably other than panic and fear, nothing will come of it. You have about as much chance of going out on the highway and being killed by a car, or probably more chance, than of being at the wrong place at the wrong time and killed by an anthrax exposure. Given where we are, Dr. Spurzel, I'm afraid that's going to have to do in, in terms of reassurances, but I thank you very much for coming in and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. I, I, I wish I could be more reassuring, but I think I am. I'm not really advocating people panic and be afraid. No, I, I, I hear that, and, and hearing it from one of the leading experts in the country I think is helpful. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. When we come back, Congress acts quickly to strengthen law enforcement and tighten airport security, but is it acting too quickly? Ask your doctor or pharmacist about Vioxx, a prescription medicine available from your doctor. Or call 1-888-VIOX-22 for information. Viox. Circuit City presents Expo 2001. 30 days of what's new, what's hot, and what's next. Featuring live demos of HDTV, digital photography, high-speed internet access, and more. All this month at Circuit City. Circuit City, we're with you. The smooth ride of a luxury car. The seating capacity of a minivan. Capabilities of an SUV. As you might expect, Congress is considering sweeping reforms in various areas involving national security. And here now with that story is my Nightline colleague, Michelle Martin. Ted, in the days after the September 11th attacks, the president went to Congress to ask for several pieces of legislation to deal with the crisis. We'll call the first one the anti-terrorism legislation, which would give the government a number of new law enforcement tools. Here's Attorney General John Ashcroft. Every day that passes with outdated statutes and the old rules of engagement, each day that so passes is a day that terrorists have a competitive advantage. Until Congress makes these changes, we are fighting an unnecessarily uphill battle. Specifically, the administration wanted to make it easier to tap cell phones and monitor email with less judicial oversight, to detain indefinitely and on minimal evidence immigrants whom the government considers a threat to national security, and to give the government greater authority to conduct surveillance on individuals and then to share that information with the intelligence agencies. Civil liberties advocates raised strenuous objections, but the Democratic Majority Senate gave the president much of what he wanted after a very quick process, including only a few hours of debate and minimal changes in the administration's bill. Only one senator voted against the bill last Thursday, Wisconsin Democrat Russ Feingold. Preserving our freedom is the reason we are now engaged in this new war on terrorism. We will lose that war without a shot being fired if we sacrifice the liberties of the American people in the belief that by doing so, we will stop the terrorists. This On the House side, no, the complaints I persisted, yes. including yes. among Republicans, that the proposals gave the government too much power and that the bill was rammed through so fast, some members didn't have time to read it thoroughly. We must be careful not to trade our personal freedoms for the promise of security. Once we have sacrificed the civil liberties of our nation, uh, that our nation was founded on, then and only then have we allowed terrorism to defeat us. But after including a provision to allow the electronic surveillance provisions to expire in no more than five years, the House also passed the bill. Now the two versions have to be reconciled, but all sides expect the core provisions to remain intact. The second bill working its way through the Congress would address the issue of airline security. The Senate passed that last week also. Among its provisions, it would increase the number of armed federal air marshals, strengthen cockpit doors and locks, and allow the FAA to give pilots permission to carry firearms in the cockpit. But this bill has stalled. ABC's Linda Douglas explains why. 
The Senate bill would create a whole new federal security force to work at airports, and House Republicans absolutely hate that. They don't want to enlarge the federal government. They don't want to create a new body of new federal employees who are very difficult to fire under civil service. And right now, they're refusing to vote on that airline security bill. The White House is backing them up for the moment, saying they want to do something involving more private workers. But House Republicans are very worried that this is going to start to hurt them politically. Ted, another big fight is coming over the various proposals to stimulate the economy, and in fact, that may be the biggest fight of all. Last week, the House Ways and Means Committee reported out a bill that would provide about $100 billion in tax cuts. Otherwise, we wouldn't report that except for the fact that it was a straight party line vote, the first time that's happened since the crisis, and people are thinking that's a, a sign of things to come. Well, uh, the president has been asking for things to get back to normal. I don't think that's exactly what he meant, but why partisanship here? For some people, this is about core principles. Um, this is an ideological as well as a partisan breakdown. The Republicans favor proposals that would give tax cuts to big business. There are some tax cuts for individuals. They think that's the best way to stimulate the economy. The Democrats think, number one, the tax cuts are too big on top of the ones that the president has already received. And they also think it just favors big business. That's not their constituency. They like to see more help to workers, especially those who've lost their jobs. When people start talking about tax cuts to stimulate the economy, has anybody yet even done the math on how much all this anti-terrorist activity is going to cost, not to mention the war itself in Afghanistan? People are doing the math, but the question is, are those numbers real? And, of course, the obvious question is whether these proposals would actually do any good. And this is a fight that we've been having in, in Washington for 20 years, if, if not longer than that. Michelle Martin, thank you. When we come back, I'll talk with a leading Democrat who has been working with the White House on some proposed reforms. Tens of thousands of people continue to purchase new Oldsmobiles, like the completely redesigned 2002 Bravada. Are they impressed with its best-in-class 270 horsepower engine? Are they impressed with its five-year, 60,000-mile GM protection plan? Or are they simply impressed? Are you in the market? Get in an Oldsmobile, backed by GM. Right now, get interest-free financing on all new Oldsmobiles. Let's help keep America rolling. Sub-Zero flavor inside. Delicious cold minty shell outside. The gum that puts your breath on ice for a long time. Dentine ice. Nothing's colder than ice. They tried our refreshing blue flavor. Mm. They tried our minty green flavor. Mm. Then we told them both were Listerine. Mm. Cool Mint and Fresh Burst Listerine. All of Listerine's germ-killing power with great taste. Wednesday uh, at 8, 7 central. Woo! Get ready for the biggest episode ever of My Wife and Kids. See you Wednesday at 8, 7 central on ABC. Lean on me. Rambler Jeans leaned on keratin to take the hassles out of employee health insurance with fast, accurate claims processing. Call Keratin or ask your broker to find out how you can simplify your company's employee health insurance. Keratin. We all need somebody to lean on. She's got my keen sense of adventure. She's got my natural Woo! grace. Ow. But I don't want Jenna to have scars like mine. I treat her cuts and scrapes with Neosporin. Neosporin not only kills more strains of infectious bacteria, a clinical test shows that treating scrapes with Neosporin helps minimize the appearance of scars. She's even got my... my classic beauty. Prevent infection. Help minimize the appearance of scars. Use Neosporin every cut, every time. Finally, a radio station that gets it. They call it The River, and it's something totally different. The new 100.3 The River. That's come on, baby. Rock and roll, blues, unplugged acoustic, I hope you had the time of your life. and some great new stuff. Tell me, did the wind sweep you off your feet? They even brought back Phil Williams in the morning. The new 100.3, The River. Finally, a radio station that gets it. And joining me now, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Patrick Leahy. These are not the easiest times, Senator. 
uh, to be convincing the American public that constitutional protection ought to be number one on their list of priorities. Should it, in fact, be? Do you believe it should be? Well, yes, ultimately, we've got to protect our Constitution. We can do both. I mean, we can maintain our security and protect our Constitution. If we don't do both, then in one sense, the terrorists really win in this battle. But I, I firmly believe we can do both. We can improve our security. We certainly know there are practical steps. We could take everything from increasing the number of border uh, patrol people we have to better computers to better uh, means of identification, but do it in a way that maintains the constitutional balances that we fought a revolution to have, we fought a civil war, that we fought world wars to have. I've had the Attorney General tell me that he wants the FBI now to become far more proactive, and if, as he put it, we end up you know, losing a federal trial, well, so be it. We're less worried about that than we are in, in capturing the bad guys. Not his precise uh, language, but the essence of it. It would, it would be easy if it was that easy, but it's not. I mean, I was a prosecutor. I know at times you chafe at the uh, restrictions you might have in the long run. You're better off following them. For example, uh, it didn't take any new law to be able to hire a lot more translators. We've given the FBI billions of dollars over the years, and yet they had a whole lot of material before September 11th uh, that they weren't able to translate. We have to be able to do that better. They're asking local law enforcement, they're saying, uh, here's this list of 200 people to be on the lookout for. Local law enforcement are the most, ones most apt to see them, say, well, do you have any photographs? Can you tell us who they are, what they look like? And they say, no, but here's the names. Well, the names all sound alike. They've got to do a far better job of being able to get off if these people have visas. Say, okay, here's the photographs that came with their visas. At least have that to look at. So it's, uh, the, the idea that suddenly if we passed, especially the first legislation came up here, the legislation that the White House has since disowned. I, if we had passed that, say, two months ago, uh, without doing the real practical things that should be done, the trade tower still would have come down. Uh, passing a law is not going to protect us. Better law enforcement, better intelligence, working more closely with local and state law enforcement can help protect us. You know, Senator Leahy, that we are likely to face more terrorism here at home over these next few weeks and months. And if and when it comes, you also know that the reaction of the public is going to be to turn to its law enforcement officials and say, do something about it and do it now. And frankly, I don't care that much about those protections that you have been talking about these last few minutes. When that day comes, what are you going to say to your constituents and well, to everybody else? It's just like the people who say, I don't like what I heard on television. We ought to have a law to censor those people because it's so uh, offensive to me. You bet. Should, and we're, and we're going to be hearing more of that, too. And, and should we do that? I mean, should or those who say, well, we should censor the press. They shouldn't be able to question what the, uh, uh, the military is doing. They shouldn't be able to question what our law enforcement are doing. They shouldn't ask questions about whether my neighbor gets locked up or not. But where it come down to is, if one of them were suddenly to get picked up in, in an obvious, uh, illegal or unconstitutional way, then that same person say, wait a minute, I'm an American. I have my rights. Why are you doing this to me? Well, we're making sure that the rights are protected and law enforcement has a tool to go after these people. Just as uh, the thought was that we'd win the world, uh, world War II by locking up Japanese Americans, well, that had nothing to do to help us win the war. We did it. It's a blot on our, on our history. In fact, probably hurt us because we lost the ability to have a lot of people who could have helped us uh, during World War II. Senator Leahy, it's always a pleasure having Thank you on you. the broadcast. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. For the United States, the immediate task at hand may be a successful operation in Afghanistan, but then what? A complicated jigsaw puzzle when we come back. The smooth ride of a luxury car. The seating capacity of a minivan. Capabilities of an SUV. All in one totally innovative package. Introducing the all new 2002 Buick Rendezvous. What, you were expecting Igor? <laughs> Buick Rendezvous, it's all good.
You've all read this. Top shelf consultants. Two million bucks. Pure strategic thinking could put us years ahead. The board is psyched. I'm psyched. It's a brilliant plan. One question. Given our current technology, is this implementable? No. 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 Strategies you can actually execute? No. Now there's a plan. Still psyched? Enter a new era of discovery at Bristol Myers Squibb, where groundbreaking genetic research is underway. Winning the Tour de France was a victory for cancer medicines. But Luke, it's just the start of incredible things to come. At the Bristol Myers Squibb Center for Applied Genomics, researchers strive to unlock the secrets of breast cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes to lead the way in new frontiers against disease. Hope, triumph, and the miracle of medicine. Bristol Myers Squibb Company. More questions about anthrax, where it's coming from, and can the workplace really be made safer? And are the media fueling anxiety and fear? Tomorrow on World News Tonight. Turn your television off. Well, let me in, then I want to go out. And turn your kids on. I'm always on the wrong side of every door. And as soon as I get home, then I like to get a bite. It's a memory to last nine lifetimes. Take your family now. They'll remember it forever. Cats, live on stage. Cats, coming to the Knoxville Civic Auditorium November 16th through the 18th. Get your tickets now. There's a new way to find jobs in East Tennessee, and they're all right at your fingertips. Log on to 6JobNet at WATE.com. You'll find resume and interview tips, plus jobs like these from Baptist Health System. City Personals is Knoxville's fastest, friendliest, and most exciting way to meet someone new. Call City Personals at 588-4466. Start having fun in the next two minutes. Talk live with up to 48 Knoxville callers and meet the right person now. City Personals is fun, and you're going to love our service. So call us now at 588-4466. City Personals, the phone call that will change your life. An email from Peter Jennings in your inbox? Go behind the scenes of World News Tonight. Inside the decisions, notes from the newsroom. Get a heads up on the headlines with personal email from Peter Jennings. Sign up at abcnews.com. ...to a change of government in Kabul. And a president who once dismissed the very idea of nation building is now searching for ways to put Afghanistan back together. One of the things we got to make sure of is that all parties, all interested parties have an opportunity to be a part of a new government. That we shouldn't play favorites between one, one group or another within Afghanistan. That may prove far more difficult than the military mission. After 10 days, the Pentagon says the U.S. and Britain have inflicted enormous damage to Taliban airplanes, airports, tanks, communications and command centers. Taliban leaders and troops too have been targeted in the last few days. But in spite of the death and destruction, the United States military, for the moment at least, is holding back from finishing off the Taliban. And those troops of the Northern Alliance are growing more frustrated by the day, according to ABC News correspondent David Wright, on their front lines north of Kabul. The commanders of the Northern Alliance seem to be champing at the bit they say that their forces are in position and that they're ready to march on Kabul just as soon as they get the green light. The trouble is the political leadership of the Northern Alliance keeps putting on the brakes. The commanders also seem to be frustrated with the Americans because so far the U.S. has not been bombing the Taliban positions on the front lines just north of Kabul. One commander said today, it seems almost as though the Taliban are moving their troops and weapons into position along the front because it's safer there than it would be in Kabul. The Kabul front line of the Taliban, which has about 10, 15,000 troops, about 200 tanks, about 600 pieces of artillery, it hasn't been bombed yet by the Americans. And I think the reason simply is that the Americans do not want a Kabul to fall too quickly to the Northern Alliance forces. Um, so they're quite happy at the moment to keep the Taliban uh, outside Kabul, to keep the status quo, if you like, around Kabul. The main reason is this man, Pakistan's President Musharraf, 
he'd made an implicit threat to cut off his country's airspace if the Northern Alliance took Kabul. Today, Secretary of State Powell sought to reassure Musharraf in Pakistan, even conceding for the first time that some in the Taliban could be part of a future government. ABC News correspondent Martha Raddatz is traveling with Powell, who has now moved on to India. President Musharraf and Secretary Powell said today that they foresee for the future of Afghanistan a broad-based, multi-ethnic regime. But President Musharraf said he sees moderates among the Taliban included in that. Secretary Powell was asked about that. He seemed mighty uncomfortable with that question, but he finally said if there are moderates among the Taliban who see a new Afghanistan, the United States would at least have to listen to them. What do you mean by moderate Taliban? Did we ever hear of moderate Nazis? Harun Amin is the Northern Alliance envoy to the United Nations. He conferred today with commanders on the ground and says they are bitterly opposed to sharing power with the Taliban. To us, it's unacceptable. We hope that the uh, Secretary of State uh, would realize uh, that this is nothing more than just uh, uh, a departure from what the State Department had earlier mentioned to us. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, Mr. Colin Powell would look at Afghanistan with a natural, eye, with a neutral eye, rather than uh, a lens that is going to be tinted in, in, in a way by the Pakistanis. Perhaps the biggest obstacle to a stable government in Afghanistan is recent history. Twenty years of war have left a country ripped apart by regional, ethnic, and tribal loyalties. The bad blood between warring factions stems in part from the chaos in Kabul after the Soviets pulled out of Afghanistan and competing warlords engaged in vicious battles for power and the spoils of war. The history of this is, um, is unfortunate and it's bloody. Frank Anderson, former chief of the CIA's task force on Afghanistan, says that bloodbath is a cautionary tale. When we talk now about civilian losses uh, from our attacks, there were more than 10,000 Afghans in Kabul that were killed uh, by representatives of two factions, represented sort of now by the, um, the Northern Alliance and some remnants of uh, Pushtun groups that uh, are sort of the, the Taliban half of this fight right now. The Pashtuns, who formed the Taliban, comprise the largest ethnic group and dominate the South. The Northeast is controlled by the Northern Alliance, comprised mainly of ethnic Tajiks and Uzbeks. The center of the country belongs mostly to Shiite Muslims. This ethnic map is critical to any political roadmap for Afghanistan's future, and it's complicated by rival warlords who shift sides for money and power. What they're all playing for is position at the table. And uh, the people best uh, positioned to, to work out those complex relations, which none of us outside understands, we shouldn't deceive ourselves on that, are the Afghans themselves. That is why the old king may be so important. A Pashtun Afghan, Mohammad Zahir Shah was deposed in 1973. He's now 87 years old and lives in Rome. But today his representatives were in Pakistan, engaged in quiet negotiations for a national assembly that would eventually choose a new leader. ABC News correspondent Dan Harris is in Islamabad. I had a conversation with Zahir Shah's grandson who told me that one Afghan politician is trying to organize a minor or smaller version of what's called a loya jirga. That's a committee of concerned parties. This loya jirga would meet on October 20th in Peshawar and would include many people who have an interest in the future of Afghanistan. What is an acceptable government? It only has to meet four conditions. It has to be all Afghan. It has to be out of the drug business. It has to be out of the business of terrorism. And it has to meet some level however minimal international level for human rights. We don't care who they are if they meet those standards. And we should stay out of the kitchen to let them do it. And that is yet another complication for President Bush and his diplomatic team, how to help build a peaceful new nation in Afghanistan without having it appear like a puppet of Pakistan or the United States.
This is Chris Bury for Nightline in Washington. When we come back, what's happening to those humanitarian food packages that the U.S. military has been dropping on Afghanistan? To receive a daily email announcement about each evening's Nightline and a preview of special broadcasts, log on to the Nightline page at abcnews.com. In addition to bombs, the U.S. military has been dropping humanitarian food packages over Afghanistan. 70,000 of them yesterday alone. Jonathan Charles at the BBC filed this report from inside Afghanistan. For some, it's manna from heaven. For others, a chance to make a quick profit. People from Hoja Bahawadeen rushed to pick up humanitarian aid dropped from the sky part of the much criticized American effort to win Afghan hearts and minds. But we've discovered that not all of the food is reaching those it's intended to help. Walking around the local market, I saw stall after stall displaying the aid. So he paid 20,000 Afghanis for, the, for each package? One shop owner told me he bought the American food off some boys. It looked as though he was going to sell it for a much higher price in a country where millions are starving. Another shopkeeper, Mehdi Azizi, said people had picked up many packets, keeping one for themselves and selling the rest. And just down the road are the people who are really desperate for the help. This refugee camp hasn't had a delivery of aid for three weeks. Mengali came here after the Taliban burned down his house. He has a wife and nine children to feed, but on most days, there's nothing to give them. Mengali says he hasn't eaten so far today. If he's lucky, he might be able to beg for some bread. These refugees urgently want the Americans to drop them more aid. The amount delivered so far is negligible. To them, it's much more important than the West's war on terrorism. For now, the unsupervised distribution of Western aid is the only answer. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Afghanistan. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, the latest on the anthrax scare with Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. Nightline is always on with abcnews.com. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC Wednesday. Starting at 8, 7 central, Ooh. the biggest my wife and kids ever. Come on. Damon's <laughs> wife is back, and she's brought a few extra pounds with her. But hey, if you can't beat them, <laughs> join up a tasty new my wife and kids, followed by ABC's big family comedy hit. Okay, pal, eat up. According to Jim, it all starts 8, 7 central, ABC Wednesday. This educational message is brought to you by Bill Hudson Associates. We have a caller on line six. Mr. Hotz, if I get hurt on the job, what should I do? Lots of things. First, report the injury to your boss immediately. Put it in writing and keep a copy. If you don't give your employer notice of the injury in writing within 30 days, you could lose all of your workers' compensation benefits. Also, ask for medical treatment. If it turns out that your injury is serious, call me at the office. City Personals is Knoxville's fastest, friendliest, and most exciting way to meet someone new. Call City Personals at 588-4466. Start having fun in the next two minutes. Talk live with up to 48 Knoxville callers and meet the right person now. City Personals is fun, and you're going to love our service. So call us now at 588-4466. City Personals, the phone call that will change your life. At Birkin Dodge, price matters because nobody beats Birkin. Face to face with Osama bin Laden, Peter Arnett's chilling encounter with the most wanted man in the world. He swept in with a military jacket on carrying an AK-47. As the anthrax scare grips America, find out why Cipro won't work for everyone. Tax. The spirit of New York soars from the Yankees... To the Sopranos, the Big Apple, bouncing back in a big way. Tax. 
it turned into Aaliyah's last dance. Now her music video is finally being released. Working, baby, working, baby. Sex. Sexy Heather Graham spills the secret behind her steamy scene with Johnny Depp. Plus, who's Maxim's all-time top cover girl? And one super role from Smallville. I'm Clark Kent. He is one of the few reporters who can say he stared into the face of evil. How are you? I'm Lisa Gibbons. Peter Arnett's a veteran journalist who earned his stripes on the battlefield. But Barry Nolan tells us even Arnett was afraid the day he met Osama bin Laden. He dodged bullets and bombs, reporting for CNN from Baghdad during the Persian Gulf War. But Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Peter Arnett says one of his most terrifying assignments was a simple interview with the most wanted man in the world. He made it quite clear in that interview uh, that he was serious about his declaration of war against the United States. In 1997, Arnett hiked into the harsh Afghani mountains to meet Osama bin Laden in one of his hideouts. He was escorted by some of the toughest henchmen Arnett has ever seen, heavily armed, scowling, and threatening his life along the way. If you give any indication to anyone where you've been, or if you're incapable of sending any signal, you will die. Arnett was led through the cold Afghani mountains to a thatched roof hut and waited late into the night until bin Laden mysteriously appeared. He swept in at midnight with a military jacket on carrying an AK-47 and barely gave us a greeting. Arnett was stunned to see bin Laden is six foot five. But when they sat down to speak, Osama made an even greater impression. Others have described Osama bin Laden as charismatic. How did you find him? Charismatic, I mean, certainly riveting in what he said. But at the end of the interview, he relaxed a little, sipped a little tea, engaged in a little conversation, and then departed. Arnett says bin Laden moves today through a series of mountain caves and secret tunnels he built during the Afghan war with the Russians. He bought bulldozers, trench diggers, trucks, and he, in fact, he said, the road you came up on is one I built 10 years ago. But one of the few men who've been to bin Laden's secret lair says the civilized world is closing in and the madman's time is running out. What is the end going to be for Osama bin Laden? If he's trapped in those mountains, and if Pakistan and other neighbors agree to contain him and his people, there's a good chance that sooner or later we can get him. While the military's hunt for bin Laden continues, New York is shaken by yet another anthrax scare. This time it happened here at ABC headquarters, and as Doug Bruckner reports, the fact that the victim is a seven-month-old baby they present a whole new set of problems. How serious is the anthrax scare? Just watch how Tom Brokaw signed off last night. In Cipro, we trust. Brokaw's taking the antibiotic Cipro after his office received an anthrax laced letter. Tabloid headquarters in Florida and the DC office of Senate Majority Our Leader staff. Tom Daschle have also been hit. Now the most innocent victim the seven-month-old son of an ABC News producer is sick with anthrax. There was a birthday party, uh, the baby, kind of a, a young baby, was passed around from person to person. This morning, nervous ABC employees walked by police officers to get to work. It's just a little bit scary. It just puts that doubt in your mind and it makes the terrorist win. I mean, it could be on any floor, anybody could give it to anybody. The seven-month-old was infected with anthrax through the skin, which is less dangerous but treatment with the antibiotic Cipro is a problem for someone that young. Pregnant women or nursing women or children under the age of 18. Dr. Alan Morgenstein of Glendale Memorial Hospital near LA says giving children Cipro might cause problems with developing bones. Fortunately, the baby at ABC got anthrax through the skin and this particular strain is fairly easy to treat. They haven't been bioengineered and they don't have any resistance to antibiotics. Amoxicillin, which is a penicillin drug, the same one that you would use for a sore throat or use for an ear infection, uh, and that's very effective. The infected child is reportedly doing well, but if he'd been infected with a more difficult strain of anthrax or through inhalation, doctors might have been willing to take their chances with Cipro. Meantime, the FBI is desperately trying to figure out who is terrorizing us through the mail.
The Bush administration hints bin Laden's group may be responsible. But on Good Morning America today, Tom Daschle said the enemy could be from within. I wouldn't be surprised if others are getting into the act as well. Whether the anthrax scare comes from home or the Middle East, as one senator put it, terrorism is now just one postage stamp away. Halfway around the world, American networks are using a new tool to help cover the war. No satellite trucks are required, just a couple of briefcases and a phone. Mike Bryant shows you the small gadget that's helping to bring you the big story. Meanwhile, thousands from the desolate desert or deep in the danger zone. We are staying down here and that's it. There's a new high-tech tool allowing reporters to beam live pictures back home from the world's most remote locations. Well, the video phone is uh, enormously helpful. The video phone. The device CNN's chief news executive, Eason Jordan, says is revolutionizing the way television reporters do their jobs. We can take just two laptop-sized cases and go do live TV from anywhere in the world. We've come a long way since World War II, where carrier pigeons delivered some reports from the battlefields. In Vietnam, it could take days to get pictures out of the dense jungles. Let's go! And while satellite television brought us live images from the Gulf War, much like a webcam, the video phone can go where cumbersome news equipment often cannot. Good morning, Neil. It's compact, lightweight, and can be powered by a small battery, even a car's cigarette lighter. The images are then fed through a phone line to a satellite. But there is one drawback. It's not great quality, and nobody expects it to be. Media Week writer Mark Berman says new versions with better video and audio quality are on their way as the news business competes for the latest technology. The idea is to get the news out first, and if you want to stay on top, you have to have the technology. Technology that takes you across the world in an instant to witness our new war unfold live on video phone. Those video phones cost about $7,500 a piece. Satellite time is not included. Well, New Yorkers finally have something to celebrate today with Mayor Giuliani cheering them on. The New York Yankees pulled out another incredible playoff victory just when this city needed it the most. Make no mistake, it was more than just a baseball game and more than just another thrilling playoff victory for the New York Yankees. It was a defining moment in the spiritual rejuvenation of this wounded and battle-scarred city. Having stood as a symbol of New York's glory and gluttony for almost a century, the Yankees, the seemingly perpetual world champions, have exemplified this city much in the same way the Twin Towers once did. And just days ago, it appeared the Yankees' dynasty was about to crumble, too old to defeat the young and hungry Oakland Athletics. But thanks to magic, miracles, or just plain New York moxie, the Yankees' World Series hopes are alive again, and so is the spirit of this city. The fact that people could go out and cheer and scream and yell and just smile continuously for a three-hour period. I don't know that how many New Yorkers have been able to do that for a long period of time since September 11th. As the Yankees battled in the Bronx, actress Lorraine Bracco joined a crowd of New York celebrities who came out last night to raise money for the families of the city's fallen firefighters. We got to find the courage, the strength, and be brave. And that's what uh, tonight is all about. Dennis Leary and Patty Darbinville co-hosted the event, benefiting the Leary Firefighter Fund. Well, it's important to me that uh, we raise as much money as possible for these 343 families. More than 800 people paid $200 to attend, including Liam Neeson, Natasha Richardson, John Stewart, and cast members of The Sopranos, all grateful for the sacrifices made by the city's firefighters. It's the very, very least we can do in our profession. How can you have anything but the utmost respect and admiration and appreciation for everything they've done and continue to do? They're the ones holding us together, you know? We're a mess. Everybody here is a mess. I can't imagine doing what they do, and uh, I'm very grateful, so. Of course, the Yankees' biggest fan, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, was uptown at the ball game, along with Regis Philbin and Donald Trump. They were lucky enough to witness baseball history and a victory for all of New York, one that could not have come at a better time. Coming up... You ever feel like your life was supposed to be something different? What Hollywood's most legendary superhero won't be wearing on tonight's TV premiere. X. Plus, things get dramatic for funny girl Heather Graham and screen stud Johnny Depp. 
And up next, Aaliyah. We were the first to take you behind the scenes of her last music video. Now the finished product is finally released. Ooh, working, baby, working, baby. That's next. Up next, the New York firefighters piping up on behalf of their fallen colleagues. Tomorrow on Extra, why these celebrities are coming together for an inspirational new movie. X. Then, America at War. You think charter flights are safe from terrorists, but can these private planes be turned into weapons? Tomorrow on Extra. New York's firefighters have been working together on the recovery and cleanup since September 11th, but they are also banding together in another way. Barry Nolan has the story from New York. In the best of times, ritual reinforces our faith and points us toward hope. In the worst of times, ritual can lay a comforting hand on a grief that knows no words. The pipes and drums of New York City's Fire Department Ceremonial Unit represent an important part of that department's tradition. It's more like a celebration of life because you're going to heaven and you're getting marched into heaven by bagpipers. Joe Murphy is the band chairman of the Fire Department's Emerald Society Pipes and Drums. In ancient times, that's when the, the pipes always played for someone of, uh, they've done great deeds of valor in battle. But the fabric of tradition is being stretched thin. Too many funerals, too many on their way to heaven. Saturday we had as many as 22 memorials and funerals. So uh, in some situations uh, we could only have one piper there. Because our world is out of joint. Where's this one here? They will play again today and every day for weeks to come. Firefighter Frank McCutcheon of Ladder 5. In the morning when you wake up you think about it and you're like, you know, you think you're in a dream or something like that. Uh, you know, you just go to work. They will sometimes play at two or three each day. They will play with the help of neighboring towns and states. Connecticut, New Jersey, and uh, we're very thankful for those fans also for helping us out. They will play for audiences too large and too small. They will... A symbol of the American dream.